Okay, uh, welcome everyone to the session on DHIS2 maturity. So we're a number of us who are going to uh, present here today. Um, what we will talk about in the session uh, is, oops, why is this not moving? We will talk a little bit about uh, key recommendations for a solid foundation for DHIS2. I think we have an old slide set here because I had some other. No, it's here. Okay, never mind. <laughs> My bad. I'll start over. Um, we know that to build a DHIS2 system, my name is Anna, by the way, I work in the global implementation team here at the HISP Center, and I'm here with other colleagues as well, also working uh, at the HISP Center. Uh, a lot of what we do is to uh, support uh, the HISP network uh, with sort of global resources for planning, uh, for assessments, etc. So we'll go through some of these resources today, and many of them are around these foundational domains of DHIS2. So not necessarily only how to build a program, but how to make your systems last over time. So today we're going to talk about some of the key recommendations that we give out to build uh, sustainable DHIS2 systems. Um, and also a little bit how countries are doing. We have some data from some assessments we have been doing in the past years, so we'll go through that. And also point you to some available resources, uh, teaching materials, etc., that can be useful if you're communicating with the ministry or you want to learn more. I also want to say it was said in the plenary session, but in case you didn't hear that message, um, the Norwegian government will today at around noon test a new warning system. So there will be very loud alarms outside from the rooftops and all phones that are connected to the 4G or 5G network in Norway will sound off, I think, quite a loud sound, uh, even if it is on silent or you turned off notifications and everything. So we will try to end a little bit before and it's only a test. So... The Russians are not coming, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> I think they're just preparing <laughs> in case there are any troubles. Okay, it's only a test, so it will be exciting to see how loud this is. So uh, we have shown this picture before, uh, but I think it is uh, still a valid picture. In order to uh, have your sustainable, good programs functioning over time, you need a proper foundation. So very often we want to build quite fancy things on top, like this house, your nice tracker programs that are going to reach thousands of facilities, etc. But if you build it on very shaky foundations, it might just fall over and crash. So we will talk about some of these foundational domains in the session today. Uh, they are sometimes a little bit invisible, very often underfunded. Uh, people don't necessarily put them in their proposals or want to pay for it, but they are very important. And I think everybody working with information systems in general will agree to that. What we're talking about today is not necessarily very DHIS2 specific, but it is very relevant for everybody working with DHIS2. So in the past year, we have been doing um, a lot of work around what we call the DHIS2 maturity profile. This is a tool um, originally funded by Gavi and Global Funds, uh, where we wanted to learn more about how our country is doing in terms of their DHIS2 implementations. Very often it's easy to say, ah, oh, things are challenging, it's going well, but we wanted to dig a little bit deeper to understand how are we doing on different domains. As you can see here um, at the bottom, we have what we call foundational areas. This is like the foundation of the house, the pillars that DHIS2 is standing on. If these things are not in place, probably your system will stop working pretty soon. So you might have quite a lot of funding starting up to build, for example, your um, your uh, COVID-19 immunization registry, for example, or an, or an HIV tracker or just aggregate surveillance. But if you don't have things like proper governance in place, uh, you have a system to train your end users, uh, funding and systems to handle your infrastructure, it might be a wasted investment over time. 
This map just shows some of the countries or the countries where this exercise has been done. Um, his groups have been working closely with HMIS and progr health programs to go through almost like a questionnaire, understand a little bit where they are on a on a scale from uh, from one to four. Of course, this is not exact science in any way, but it's it has served as a good conversational tools, I think, with the programs and the HMIS to discuss what should our priorities be going forward. So in this session here today, we will focus on this foundation, the, the pillars of the of the of the fancy DHIS2 health programs, um, what it takes uh, to work in these different domains. As I said, we will talk a little bit about what kind of advice in general the HISP network is uh, is giving to uh, to countries. Um, we will pick out some findings from this maturity profile exercise just to see in general, what, uh, what countries are, are struggling with, and also point you to some resources. So the presentation we will show today will be full of links, so you can access the PowerPoint later and, and enter those and, and have a look. It's all open and, and free and documents, of course. So I will start talking through two domains. So the first one is leadership and governance. I think this has been mentioned by several of the presenters in the conference, the importance, and also yesterday in the plenary, the importance of having a country that uh, knows what it wants and has a clear sort of governance and leadership model. Sometimes we see in countries that are not so well performing that you might just have a technical team who is working on whatever they, think is the most important. So if uh, if someone is asking for something, it comes to the top of the queue, while it, not, it might not be the, the long-term priorities of the country. So in general, what we recommend when we talk about governance is that a country has a two or three layered governance structure. This means that you should have some sort of governance committee that has broad representation from the stakeholders in the country so that health programs are represented, uh, people with decision power are represented. They can make some decisions on saying that this is the direction we are going in with digital health and DHIS2 in particular. Um, we want to go here and we believe that doing aggregate TB nationally uh, has priority number one. And this other program has priority number two. And we also have to work on performance training, et cetera, so that it's clear to everybody. Also in this governance model, uh, we recommend that there is some sort of operational management. So somebody who can sort of work day-to-day uh, -day on planning, has some oversight of activities. Um, and then you have uh, at the bottom what it says, the core technical team. These are the people, the technicians who are doing the day-to-day -day fixing, building DHIS2 systems. But it can be a bit vulnerable if you only have a good technical team. You also need somebody who sets some strategic direction. Another important thing around this uh, leadership and governance uh, topic is that you have um, preferably one DHIS2 core team across many programs. Sometimes we see that this one program has their DHIS2 people, the other program has their DHIS2 people, but ideally it's good to have one team. And also that this mechanism is known to partners, to stakeholders who want to invest in digital health, that it's like a clear and transparent system and people are appointed and they have some roles, they are meeting regularly, et cetera. And that there is some documentations on how they make decisions, how they make priorities um, and references from, from meetings. And of course, there is different skill sets needed at different levels of this governance mechanism. So these are some quotes. I'm going. I'm not going to read them out loud. But these are some, not quotes, but but notes from from our HISP network when we have been conducting these maturity assessments. So, I have been talking to the talking to the ministries, trying to understand what is the status of sort of leadership and governance in country X, um, and taking some notes. So you can see that for some countries, there is no existing governance body in place. It's done through like random requests and requirements from specific programs. Um, countries say, or in countries, it's just not sufficiently functional. There might be lack of clear vision on how to implement and maintain DHS2, lack of digital strategy. 
um, programs develop tools as they would like. We see uh, examples of governance bodies that are established, but they lack representativeness from the relevant uh, programs, not sufficiently functional, or that they do not meet regularly. So there is a governance body or committee in place, but there is no clear regular um, meeting, um, uh, meeting schedule. So uh, we have some uh, learning resources. These are a couple of slide sets that might be interesting if you're interested in this topic to have a look at. Um, many of the resources we refer to in this session are uh, academy material that we have used to teach both online and in, uh, or in, in physical academies. So they're typically slide sets like these. Please read them, use them if you want with your, with your stakeholders in your countries. Um, just steal and, and, and reuse the messages. That's perfectly fine. We will open up for like a discussion and questions at the end. So I will uh, continue on another topic. This is strategy and investment. This is another key pillar of your uh, DHIS2 house. Here, we clearly advocate that countries should have one DHIS2 plan where possible. Per governing ministry, we just came from this plenary talking about education. So, of course, you would have an education DHIS2 plan and a health DHIS2 plan. Um, but it's really beneficial if you can get people to align around one plan so that multiple stakeholders can invest in these foundational domains. So, for example, if you initiate a new HIV program or an EPI program, can you also get them to invest a little bit in security or in servers or in uh, skill building for the core team, etc.? That's beneficial for everybody. Again, avoid implementing in silos. This is related to, uh, to the point above. The goal is really an integrated system both to make it easier to manage and also to be able to use the data across programs. Triangulate data is useful. Also to focus on the fundamentals of DHIS2 for sustainability. So again, really advocate for these foundational pieces that we are talking about today. Um, we see them come up again and again. We try when we talk to countries, both in the HISP groups and at the HISP center, to be have a little bit this principle of saying no to unfeasible projects. Sometimes we can be blinded by, um, by new and shiny ideas. But if we know that they are not feasible to sustain over time, either because they are lack of funds, lack of skilled staff, um, then maybe we should just say no or do something else first. But at the same time, you know, it's important to be flexible and adopt to new opportunities. So this is this balance of uh, sometimes you should say no, but of course, sometimes you need to take a chance and be a bit brave. Um, but I think many of us, and I'm sure it's the same for everybody in the room, we, we, we sometimes see a lot of unrealistic projects that if you actually sit down and you do the math and you start to really budget then it's a bit, it, it doesn't add up, right? And sometimes you say yes to just stay in the game or get the project, but if it's a waste of a lot of money in the beginning and it will die after a couple of years, then maybe we should be like clearer on saying, saying no to things. And we really advocate for highlighting and budgeting for long-term implementations. So don't just say what it costs to, to set it up, but also what will it cost to keep it running for year two, year three, year four, year five? Here also, there is a very interesting results from this exercise of, of doing the maturity assessments in 40 plus countries. Um, countries are saying that there's no core HMIS funding, um, that DHIS2 plays central roles in the country's health strategy, but there is no costed work plan for sustainable technical assistance over time, that strategy documents are outdated, that HMIS is mainly donor funded. I think many of these things doesn't necessarily come as a surprise to anyone, but it's, it's really documented and, and uh, we can maybe do something about some of them. Again, you can access uh, all of these resources uh, in the slide deck later. 
Um, we have um, we have resources in our DHIS2 documentation that you can find on our website where we talk a little bit about what we believe are important aspects to think about for high level planning and budgeting. We have um, tools for doing actual DHIS2 budgets, uh, just Excel tools that you can download and adapt to your own use. These tools, uh, they uh, give you some assistance to budget for pilot uh, projects. It gives you assistance to budget for scaling up to your whole country. And we also have some support for calculating end user training scenarios. That's very often the biggest cost of scaling up something nationwide when you suddenly have to train 10,000 health workers and some of them have to travel and the costs are very varying from country to country. Um, so we have uh, in this uh, in this template here we have um, we have made uh, made a tool to help you do that. Also calculate how long will it take. For example, if you say that we would like to do this project in quarter one, but if you actually do the math of how long will it take to train all these health workers, maybe it is a four year training plan to get through it. So I think this is a it's a helpful tool. Um, I have personally used it in a couple of countries, and it's been a good. Even again, maybe the number you get out here is not like the exact number with two lines under it. It gives an idea whether is this project matching to the project funds you have available, et cetera. So the link is in the slide deck and you're happy to, to download it and just adapt and use it as you want. I will give the word to Shuradit talking about another pillar of DHIS2, how security and compliance. I was thinking maybe at the end of everything, or we could stop now and have She's a short. Yeah, we can speak. We can stop now and have a short uh, discussion around these two topics. Uh, yeah, wait, wait for the microphone so the Zoom can hear you. And also, others feel free to answer. I mean, there is a lot of expertise in this room, so I don't claim to be the one with the answers here. <laughs> Okay, good morning. I'm Peter Ricketts, Open Solutions, Dominica. Um, I have a few questions. Uh, the first one being in terms of the management of the data dictionary. So I know that um, you were talking about um, <clears throat> your governance, right? But in, in terms of strategy for managing that data dictionary, because one of the things I have found um, that was a challenge when we just got into DHIS. So, you know, you have these standard metadata packages, but they all use, um, they're not, they're not uh, synergized. They're, 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 meta, they're, they're metadata. So you would have duplicated um, data elements being imported um, when you do that. So in terms of that strategy, what would you recommend um, in terms of where in that, that hierarchy would, the, would that be managed? You know, is it operations? Um, where in the governance structure would you see that falling? The second question would be, is there a feasibility assessment tool? So you, you mentioned um, saying no to particular projects that you may not consider sustainable over the long run. So is there a feasibility, let's say, um, assessment checklist that you could quickly assess? And then, you know, dovetailing from that, would you recommend just saying no to the project or would you then recommend to the client um, how they or what they need to do um, to create a, a sustainable um, or to achieve sustainability, and then of course, in your tool for budgeting, does it also take into consideration the post implementation support that we've heard about in some of the previous um, presentations as well? So yeah, these are my questions. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Um... I'll go backwards here from your last question. Yes, the budgeting tool, it covers post-implementation support. So we, it, it sh I mean, I can open it. Um, uh, If I remember my password on. Uh... <laughs> no, 
Okay, I don't remember my password now. I'm standing here in stress. But anyways, yes, it it it, it does cover post implementation support. So annual maintenance budgets, like what does it cost year two, year three? So you need to pay your core team salaries. You need to pay your security girl or guy a salary. You need to pay for the server, not just buying the server, but you know, going down the line. So yes, it covers that. Um, the no versus uh, no to project versus how to get there. Of course, I think it's a, uh, you should of course advocate for, <laughs> for how to get there. Yeah. But my, my point was just like, don't say yes, sort of uncritically because people want something. If you, it's our role to sit and, and, and think, is it a good idea or not? On a multiple number of factors. I mean, ethics and security and, and many things, right? Um, in terms of feasibility assessment, um, from the HISP Center, we have a tool that we call the readiness assessment, uh, which will, um, for countries that are starting up with DHIS2, it can be a useful tool to just go through, do we have these things in place before we get started? Um, I can add the link to that as well in the slide set afterwards. Um, I think also using this DHIS2 maturity profile tool can serve as a form of a readiness assessment for, for doing more advanced. It does not give you like a calculate, a yes or a no, whether you should start something, but it's, it gives an indication. If you see that many of these foundational domains that we're talking about today is scoring quite poorly. And you can also contact us if there are specific countries you would like to learn more um, about in terms of how they're scoring. Um, then I think you should at least carefully consider your project. I mean, you need to look at it in a holistic way. I'm not sure if that gave a clear answer. Do you want to talk to the data dictionary, Olaf? You don't want to, but you can do it. Yeah, you want to start? No, I think in terms of exactly, I think it's very important. Yeah, so I'm uh, Ola, also part of the implementation team at the HISP Center. Uh, and I've been involved a lot in this packages toolkits. Um, I think, first of all, in terms of what what level in the governance structure does it fit, I think important to keep in mind that this is sort of a very much a model of how it could be done, and each country will be different in how, much, how this is set up. Um, and what the exact roles are. Uh, but I think it's important that there is the core team, I think, should not be the ones who are managing the, the dictionary in itself. But of course, they will be important. For example, if you're considering these metadata packages, reviewing, is this a useful tool for us? If we're implementing X, whether it's a tracker program or in introducing a new uh, aggregate sort of program, they will be useful in terms of reviewing what do we have, uh, what is in this, and sort of making some assessments. But they shouldn't be the ones who sort of make decisions on what this, what our indicators should be, and uh, what the data collection should be, etc. And then I think something where um, uh, I think Bob can talk more to that. But in terms of the metadata, uh, we also need to keep in mind that, um, especially as sort of the architecture in the country is advancing. You also have to deal with sort of uh, metadata that is used across systems um, that needs to be stable and there needs to be really good uh, structure in place. Um, Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so just leave it. I'll, I'll leave the word to Bob. Yeah, so. <laughs> Uh, it's going to go over my head. Yeah, no, it's, it's a good question, and it's got, it's got lots of layers to it. Um, um, it's, it's quite interesting, even if you go back to the literature from the 1990s, right, the very early implementations of DHIS-1, this question of coming together and building harmonized metadata between programs was central to everything they were writing about. 19, when did it start? 1904, 95, many papers about it, Jens, triangle of standards and things like that. I, I think it happened, the, the actual work, I think happens at two levels. I think there is a technical dimension to it, 
or in terms of making sure that there are not inconsistencies and there are not contradictions and stuff in the actual metadata itself. And over time, these things tend to creep in. But then I think the really important layer is the system ownership layer. Right? System, system owners are the ones who, who own their metadata and they have to own it as a group, particularly if the metadata has been put onto the same system. So it does involve negotiation and, and formal kind of processes. Um, and I think different countries have come up with different models of, of doing that, um, of reviewing and change management around the better data. I think HISP South Africa, for example, has a very long history with it. Uh, it's not an easy problem, um, and it's a problem that grows over time. Um, and you know the, the, the WHO packages are probably a good example of us not eating our own dog food, in a sense, because a lot of them were developed by different teams. <laughs> And, and they didn't do what we're telling countries that we know that they should do. And I think that's, that was learned over time. And now a lot of the work has been around rationalizing and building common libraries on which toolkits are built upon. Um, but yeah, I think it sits there between those two levels. And the really important thing about that, that middle level is not a simple level because you've got many different stakeholders on it and you have to create the formal mechanisms by which they meet and negotiate and um, manage metadata change. So what we see in most places, it's, it's unmanaged and it becomes chaotic really, really quickly. So yeah, it's a good point, uh, probably a session on its own. <laughs> Thank you. And also, of course, all of these decisions, they don't have to be taken in the governance committee, of course, you could appoint someone, appoint a working group who is responsible for ABC. So yeah, it's not that everything happens with the same people sitting in each layer. Um, Michelle, oh, were you first? Sorry, we had a question from budget. I think you were first, sorry, yeah. Okay, yeah, sorry, just a small clarification. So the budgeting, does it, uh, uh, you know, include costs country-wise or, uh, category of country-wise, because even when in countries, even if you talk of salaries or other implementation costs, uh, you know, holding trainings and all can vary. So for example, PNG would be much more expensive than Myanmar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you just you just uh, adjust your local costs, like uh, how much does it cost to conduct a training in country X and you change the number and it would calculate. Does that make sense? I mean, you select a country and it will automatically... No, no, you have to build it yourself. Yeah, yeah, it's not that advanced. <laughs> no, no, I don't I don't know the cost of, of training in PNG or in Pakistan or in... So it's uh, you. It's just an Excel tool that you work with, yeah. Michelle, at the back. I think in terms of the budgets, I think what the key sort of usefulness of it, because it, in terms of the actual calculations, it's very simple. But it sort of includes the categories that you need to include in a budget. I think that's maybe the main utility that you you don't leave things out. What you must remember to put aside money for, yeah. Okay, I just wanted to actually following up when you talked about the feasibility and the readiness mm -hmm. assessment. Um, and I'm not sure maybe this already is the one that's aligned with some of the work that WHO has been doing, but. So Anne isn't here, but I see Ryan might be able to, there's, so they are doing work of kind of overall HMIS readiness assessment and in particular for like TB where it's, mm. it's tracker. So it's including the, some of the digital aspects, but also the kind of programmatic aspects of, mm. are you ready to go to case surveillance for TB? And, and if you're not just what, are, what's, what would you need in place? And so it's not necessarily saying don't go do it, but it's saying, make sure you have, go and plan and budget for X, Y, Z. Um, so maybe you could also add that, yeah. uh, check in with Anne and add the links. They're just finalizing that too under this um, piece. And I know she's been trying to link it with, um, with Rebecca and some of the pieces out of the maturity profile so that it is kind of a flow that it's both, a, you can have the digital system, IT system feasibility along with the programmatic uh, feasibility of going to some of these yeah. um, fancier level systems. Okay. Thanks. I think we need to move uh, on. We have several more topics. It's all very interesting to discuss, but I think we'll move to security. Uh, sure. Oh, you're running with the mic. Hmm? 
Ja. Um, yep. Good morning, everyone. So my name is uh, Shirajit Dutta. I work for the His Center as well. Um, for security, I'm speaking on behalf of our security lead, Michael Markovich. He couldn't be here. Um, there was a session yesterday on security as well, um, where he's able to speak more um, to a lot of these topics. I think what we wanted to highlight, though, is when we're looking at maturity, there are a couple aspects of security that are quite important um, to consider. And that's, you know, whether or not we consider this mature within various frameworks. So the first thing that we're looking at is, is ownership. And in particular, we're looking for kind of decision-making priority. So we have kind of data owners and technical owners, but we, we don't want this muddied. We want kind of a clear person or people kind of identified to make decisions about security. And if that's not in place, then there might need to be some, some work to make that happen. Um, the, the second thing is kind of frameworks of for security. Um, so this is kind of actual written policies or procedures that deal with specific security um, principles. So you can look at it from kind of two different sides. One is maybe more broader policies and frameworks, and the other is kind of more kind of practical um, standard operating procedures. An example for people in the DHIS2 realm, it might be user management and sharing of passwords. This might be a standard policy that needs to fit within your kind of um, overall security policy framework um, and aligned with what you're doing there. Um, we also assess kind of implementation. So this is uh, the actual kind of technical tools that are used to kind of implement those very security frameworks. Um, in place and the teams that actually implement those frameworks do they have the capacity to sustain this over a long period of time do you have the right resources in place um, to do this to the standard that you're supposed to and the last um, aspect here is assurance and what you're looking at is the ability to actually demonstrate kind of compliance um, to external parties or other interested parties that might be interested of course there's many different security standards and frameworks um, from time to time you might need to be able to demonstrate that you can meet those security standards um, and not just kind of outside of this broader kind of framework of meeting various compliance and standards, but also kind of just being able to demonstrate how you've implemented certain um, components um, of your security framework um, to various interested parties, just so they kind of know how things are working underneath the hood. So the results from the maturity assessments have been kind of aligned with a number of the categories I've just discussed. Um, there is some challenges around kind of the availability of material um, for security. And this is something I'll talk to you in the next slide, but uh, you can see that there are some issues around documentation, around legal procedures actually, like various bills and laws in the country that people could follow in order to develop their various frameworks. Um, and you know, this is something that we're hoping to address a little bit over time. Um, SOPs is another area that we're hoping to kind of work on a bit more. So there are some, some resources that are available. One, we, one is this uh, security starter kit. Um, we're looking at revising this further throughout the year um, to contain some actual examples of standard operating procedure templates, for example, um, to look at uh, risk assessment guides and some other types of information. Um, there's also a reference DHIS2 installation that uh, this uh, link that I have on screen that shows kind of some of the best practices um, for implementing security within uh, DHIS2 itself. Um, so I encourage you to have a look at those if you're interested. And also there's um, a session from yesterday where there are more materials on security itself. Um, the next topic I'm going to discuss real quick is on the uh, core team and training end users. So there is a session on this uh, later today. So I'm not going to discuss it too much. Um, all, all we're trying to kind of promote here is that uh, in the DHIS2 community, we have been speaking about um, building core teams in countries for a long period of time. Now we just tried to develop some guidance around this and what that might actually look like. Um, so we've identified some different roles um, and identified their, their role descriptions, um, as well as kind of what their kind of um, um, contribution would be within a broader scheme of different actors. Um, and we have a number of material on this and we can discuss this more um, in the session later on. Um, just to highlight that these are roles, not, not people. So you don't always need a, a large number of people in all contexts and it is context specific. Um, you know, you might have small island countries with smaller populations, you might have larger countries that might need a little bit more. So this is always dependent on the situation. So from the maturity assessment, we had some, some um, challenges here in terms of core team development and support. And I think this is also why we've been looking at kind of developing some structure around this to provide a bit more insight as to how this can work in practice. Um, there's often a lot of issues with the, the core team kind of still depending on, on his support. Um, this is an ongoing issue that we're trying to kind of actively address. 
Um, we know that there's um, often not enough funding for kind of routine capacity building activities for this team, right? These are just kind of ad hoc, okay, let's get this training in, or we have this specific project, so let's try to do something. But uh, longer term planning um, around this kind of core team capacity building is not uh, often in place. Um, and then um, areas like SOPs and other areas where we're trying to develop more to provide information that those core teams can use um, as actual material in the countries, um, not just kind of more regional or global material, which is the bulk of what we have right now. Um, so the second part of this is then training end users. Uh, this is, uh, we refer to end users as a, a separation between the core team. The core team is kind of part of that three-layered governance framework that Anna showed at the beginning, right? They're responsible for kind of maintaining or managing the implementation at a national scale. So they might have a lot of different activities that they're involved in. These end users could be at various levels. Um, they could be maybe people entering data or analyzing data at a district or facility level, for example, or end users out in the community that are maybe entering mobile data, for example. So they, they, this can vary based on the context. They could also have a lot more responsibility as well. So this can vary in terms of their scope of work. Um, but the whole idea in terms of training and users that we want to emphasize is that this is a continuous process. It's not a one-off process. So whether it's that user in the field collecting community health data on a mobile phone, or it's some type of administrator sitting in a province or a state um, performing more um, uh, higher level functions. Um, the idea is that the system is kind of continuously evolving there's new requirements, and of course, there's different types of features and other types of priorities that they have to kind of respond to based on their context, and, and the system will kind of continue to update. So um, with these trainings, just like with the core team, it's not one time, it's an ongoing process, and we'll discuss this more later on uh, today. So um, from, the, uh, from the results of the assessment, you can see here some of the, the information that was provided to us. Um, and it's very similar in terms of the feedback uh, for the core team, um, where the, the training was kind of ad hoc. This is a similar finding that we had for the core team. Um, there are uh, sometimes regular trainings organized, but that's often not enough. Um, there's not enough guidance in some cases, uh, or this training is limited in scope. It's not really kind of addressing all the needs um, that are there at present. Um, so we're hoping to kind of work on this a little bit more. We have developed uh, some resources to respond to this, but um, we're working on a little bit more. For the core team in particular, we have a number of new resources um, that we've been working on, including a training needs assessment, um, a number of templates, uh, job descriptions for each of these roles, um, and uh, as well as just general kind of education principles for designing training um, taken from a number of research um, and other studies that we put together based on what we've done. Um, we also have a number of other resources, um, just some examples here. The first is the example of the, a template of the job roles and um, other information related to the core team. Um, the second is this uh, kind of learning paths for different roles that we've identified. We also have a lot of academy material and other types of resources that can be used um, at the country level for various purposes. So I'll hand it over to Olav now, unless we want to take some questions first, maybe? Or... Okay, yeah, sorry about that. Sorry, it's just it's stuck in a trash folder on Google, so we can't access things on there. Okay, I'll make that uh, publicly viewable. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll fix that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no one can access it, right? Perfect. <laughs> Perhaps quickly, Nick, I don't know if this is relevant to what you presented, but it's about uh, asking whether you inform countries about breaches, security breaches, et cetera, when they happen, and how you know they step forward to, to address them. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we do now, right? Yeah, Bob, we have a process now. Yeah. Really? Why did I know you were going to come and ask all the difficult questions? Um, I think what we have done at DHS2, certainly over the last four or five years, is made a move to become much more transparent about our kind of vulnerability management process and the like. In the past, I guess, I see last, I see people know. Um, 
if there was if there was a security problem reported, we would quickly fix it and get it out as quickly as possible. As little ceremony and as little noise as as can be. But of course, I mean there are there are rational reasons for doing that, but it's not really fair um, to leave people not knowing whether their DHS2 version is vulnerable or not. So what we are very transparent about is if we get a vulnerability reported in DHS2 or heaven forbid if a DHS2 instance gets hacked and we discover the reason for it, um, we've made a commitment that we will publish that. All the, the level of detail might vary. Um, but that also creates a little bit of responsibility now on implementers because um, now they know that, you know, after we published on the website that there is a vulnerability in version 238.3, for example. So you need to upgrade 238.4. This is no longer now a little secret thing. It's, 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 it's public. Um, and so that does create a need for, for um, responsible action and good communication right, with, with implementing groups. And we've tried to set up things like a security contact list. So most, all of the implementations that we, we could find and all the ones that we were in contact with, we tried to create a list so that we can give some early warning before the thing appears on the website. Um, if people have implementations are responsible for implementations and they're not on that list, please send an email to security at dhs2.org um, and get yourself on there. Uh, in terms of informing people about breaches, no, we don't do that. I mean, I've been responsible myself for helping a number of places with different security problems which they've had. Um, it's not our job to say this particular country has had this particular disastrous thing has happened to them. So, um, in a sense, I mean, th these are national systems. That's a national concern. It's not up to us to say whether they've been breached or not. We will help them with the breach. And if their breach was caused as a result of some problem in DHIS2, um, which is rare, but it has happened, um, then we'll make sure that we fix that and we'll publish that so that other people are aware that the vulnerability exists. Does that get to? What you are asking? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, this is Adana. I'm from Ethiopia, and uh, uh, my company is a private company called Laptech Solutions. We are providing uh, technical support for the Ministry of Health in two main. Uh, uh, Issues one is DHS to implementation and the other is data analytics. As part of our technical support to the ministry, we try to evaluate the maturity level of DHS to implementation in Ethiopia. So we try to see the DHS to maturity profile that has been shared uh, in this session, uh, but the tool that we want to use was a tool which has a level of maturity. For example, level zero is for nascent, while level five is for optimized. So while this uh, DHIS2 uh, maturity profile help us to collect qualitative data, then to just, uh, to ju just based on that qualitative data, we can uh, guide the ministry to, to, Im to improve the implementation. But our worry at that time was, is it really important to use DHIS to maturity profile or some other tool which helps the ministry to prepare a roadmap for the coming five years, specifically in sustaining and implementing DHIS2? As a result, we moved to another tool which is called SOSHI. SOSHI was forwarded by the major, uh, and this SOSHI toolkit has about five ma major domains. The, the SOSHI basically designed for health information system, not for digital systems. And we try to fit that to digital health systems. Again, what's missed is the DHIS to usability level. So again, I mean, 
I would be glad if you come up with a comprehensive tool which helps countries measure the level of DHIS2. I mean, is it level zero? Is it level one? What's level zero mean? What's level one mean? What's level five mean? I mean, if we able to know the exact material table of DHIS2 at a national level, which helps the country to put appropriate investment in a way forward and to prepare a roadmap. Okay, I can try to, to answer. So I, there are a lot of assessment tools out there, good, good assessment tools. I think we created this DHIS2 maturity profile because we found that many of the existing tools, it did not really help us to make a good DHIS2 action plan. So the questions that we ask in this tool, they're quite DHIS2 specific. Some is general, of course, that would be re relevant for any type of uh, any type of uh, information system or health information system implementation. But some questions are also quite DHIS2 specific. So uh, again, our our aim of doing this exercise is not to score anyone or to rank anyone or to publish that you are green or red or yellow, but it's to have like a tool to have good conversations to make a good plan and to also help us to say that or help everyone to say that is it feasible to do this project that you have in your priorities now i'm not sure if i answered your question but my my, my answer is that there are this is not the only tool out there there are many good tools and i'm not saying this is the only one you should do to work with dhis2 but it's it can help you to make quite dhis2 specific action plans I think maybe we should move on to the next uh, topic. Uh, just a final comment to add to what Anna said. I think another uh, thing is that uh, it wasn't the purpose to build it sort of covering everything, but to have something that can also be done relatively quickly so that you can rather do it again and see how things are progressing. So rather than have something that takes three weeks, and you do it once, we would rather have something that takes three days and you can do it every year and actually sort of use it again um, for planning, not for assessing, but for guiding the areas where you need to uh, improve. Okay, so I'll talk about um, two areas, sort of foundational areas that are uh, somewhat related here now. Uh, um, the first one is what we call the facility and population profile. Uh, and I think the, the name is not the, the best, uh, but what we're talking about here is uh, that in general, sort of as a, across the whole DHS2 implementation, uh, there is a need to have uh, an idea of the population, so denominator data, uh, and also information about the health facilities. So some basic attributes, uh, which is sort of the foundation when you're doing additional analysis sort of at the programmatic level. You need to know how many people live uh, in different districts, the facility catchments, uh, et cetera. Uh, so here we're looking at um, population estimates. Uh, one element of that is whether in DHS you have any linkages to the CRVS system. So if you have complete CRVS data, are you able to link that to DHS and use that as your uh, target population denominators for the health indicators? This is so far not very often that we actually have, first of all, complete CRVS data. Second of all, that is actually linked to DHS too. Uh, but then at least there should be population estimates typically from the census data available, uh, kept updated, um, in the DHS. Um, second is in terms of maintaining the facility uh, facility information. So do we have an updated facility list in DHS2? Which is again, sort of a foundation for all the other stuff we do in doing DHS2. If you don't have your org units in place and they're not updated, uh, um, that sort of creates problem across the board. Final thing here is around the human resource data. So whether there is information on the staff working in facilities um, and whether that is kept updated, whether you have a sort of a sensible breakdown into different staff categories. That's sort of the last element of this uh, facility population profile uh, area. 
And what, what we're seeing here from the maturity um, work is that um, CRVS is something a lot of countries are looking at, but it's not really happening, this linkage to the CRVS systems. Um, often there are some attempts, for example, if you're doing uh, um, child health trackers, immunization trackers, to try to set up a link between the births and the CRVS, for example, to send notifications. Uh, but it's quite limited. Um, the population estimates more sort of from the censuses. Countries report it's available uh, in most cases, at least down to the um, district levels. But then there are often challenges in, especially at the fa facility catchments, to keep that information up to date and available. Um, also around the facilities, a lot of countries have the geographical coordinates for a lot of the facilities, but there's always not always processes in place to sort of add new if there's a new facility to actually get those coordinates in, etc. So often the updating and maintenance is the problem. Uh, I think in the plenary session on maps yesterday, there were a lot of examples of uh, tools that can help in some of these areas. So for example, you have the Ability now with the population layers in the maps, uh, you can calculate catchment population and import and have them available um, in DHIS2. Uh, for example, using this um, micro planning app. Um, we have some examples of uh, how CRVS systems have been linked to tracker programs. Um, so there are a few resources here that you can look at. Um, in this area. Another thing, I'm going to confuse you a bit now, because uh, you also saw in the map session yesterday is that we have this uh, organization unit profile uh, uh, function now in the maps app, um, which is sort of the facility profile that we're referring to in the, um, as this sort of domain. In a few minutes, John will show us another app called the Organization Unit Profile app, which is a, a tool that the His Vietnam team is uh, working on um, to help with the whole organization unit sort of management process. So uh, I'll leave it to John to talk about that in a couple of minutes. Uh, another thing we sort of talked a bit about earlier, the metadata governance and how that is done. Um, Another element that we're looking at in this maturity uh, profile is what we refer to as the metadata quality um, and the org unit quality. And so there we're not talking about whether the indicator list is a good one, whether you're coll collecting the right data. Uh, here we're talking about sort of more from the DHS2 perspective is the way it's been configured and maintained uh, done properly. So we're seeing this metadata quality. It could be, for example, that you've somehow managed to end up with a configuration in DHS2 that is invalid, uh, which can cause functionality to break, for example, which can prevent you from actually being able to upgrade to a new version because there are invalid uh, configurations. So that's one reason this is important. Another reason is that from an end user perspective, if you have a DHS2 system with thousands of data elements, um, hundreds of indicators, and it's not properly sort of managed and structured. Uh, it's very difficult for the users to actually find what they're looking for and use DHIS2 for um, what they need it for. Uh, so we, as I come back to, we have some uh, tools to help sort of assess um, this stuff. Um, including some assessments. I think this, this is kind of, if you think of the governance model, this is typically the, the responsibility of the core team uh, to make sure that the way this is done in terms of naming conventions and groupings, uh, making sure sh sort of the sharing of the HS2 is set up so that people have access to the relevant uh, stuff. Um, that's part of the work of the core team. Um, but we see in some cases that it's, it can sort of grow out of hand and then you need sort of bigger initiative to actually try to uh, clean it up. 
uh, in terms of what we've heard now from the countries um, that have been through this uh, maturity profile is that it varies a bit. Some places uh, they say that the, the quality is okay, um, but also quite a few countries who are saying this is a problem and actually sort of hinders users of the data to um, do what they want because it's difficult to find the relevant uh, content um, and that is creating problems, for example, for the upgrades, uh, as I mentioned. Uh, so here we have, um, like I, I said, we have this uh, data integrity metadata assessment tool, which is one sort of uh, standalone tool that we made for looking at a lot of um, a lot of these sort of quality measures of the metadata. There is also, also I think, uh, underutilized function in DHIS2 for doing some of these data integrity checks. Uh, which actually covers a lot of the basics, but I think it's not something that is used routinely in um, many places. And we also have some more general documentation around best practices for metadata maintenance uh, and assessments. Last on my list is the Organization Unit Profile app, which I'll uh, hand over to John to talk about. Hi, hi. Uh, my name is John Lewis from um, His Vietnam, a part of His Special Hub and part of Union's Depositor. So that's how it is. <laughs> okay, so um, um, just to, to give a why we needed this, uh, why we built this organic profile was um, many of the countries had not one DHRS2, but multiple DHRS2. And then the core team were managing the DHRS2 and maintaining it not from one place, but multiple places. And sometimes what happens, they create an org unit and then forget to include in a proper group and then forget like to have the, the same convention of the, uh, the, the naming convention or putting it into different group sets, assigning all these things. It was creating lots of problem. And what people were trying to do is either create a new DHS to instance only to keep all their org unit in there and then synchronize across all the places. Or they used to have build their own system or use some other system to make only the mass of the list or the organ profile and sync across all the places. And that means like you require a different hosting things, you have a different team, you wear a different way of updating and all kinds of other, other, other ways. Um, then also to every time when you have an org unit, we also have to update the, the, um, uh, the coding system. Like sometimes malaria call this org unit as different coding, TB call it as a different coding. We know in DHIS2, we make it as an attribute, but like it's not been updated in, in across all the different places. So that's why we just say, okay, let's just like make a, an app built inside DHIS2, which can talk across all the other DHIS2. And that is possible in DHIS2 version 240, so that like we can listen to the what's happening, the argument changes, and we can manage those things in different places. That's one particular point. And the other point was also to analyze the data, what we are collecting on as an organ profile. We in DHS to one stage uh, during the access, we already have the main thing called organic profile, where the first step was is to address the what this organic means, whether it is a private, a public, a NGO, where it is located, those were uh, mandatory fields. And now most of the time, like when we install in DHS2, we don't even have those groups and groups that defined. So something to give a bit of structure of how do you manage and you maintain your organic. So those were the some things which we can try to use. And also how do you analyze this data, what we call semi-permanent data, which is infrastructure, human resources, and how best we can try to link together. Yeah, so um, that's why we try to build this uh, app, which can give not only the DHS support team, but also the managers just saying um, how many org units we have. And we classify the org unit usually from the long history, uh, one is service delivery unit, one is administrative unit, which is province and other things. And then we have offices like PHO, malaria office, anti-malaria office, and usually they have different, different names, different people. So we need to combine all these things together to make a, a bigger place. And then during the COVID, what happened, like we also use the, the prison, the shopping malls and all the things for the vaccination. And for COVID system, it was an organic but it's not necessarily the org unit in your national HMI system. Sometimes you will use the temporary org unit for, 
for your own data collection, for your own health program. How do we best manage all these things up? And then we coming down to the villages, like more, more and more DHRs too are having this catchment area and collecting the data based on the village. How do we best manage all these things? So that's why we were trying to, to use this functionality. I'll just like quickly go to the demo itself instead of like going on to the, the PPT. I hope we can share. It'll be fine for the online. Thank you, Sherry. Yep, I share it over there. And as in DHS, the first step, what we have tried to do, oh, here. Um, I had logged in, but like in DHS, we have the timeout. Yeah. That's good security. So usually when I present any kind of app or anything, so I'll go for the analysis to data entry. But this time I'm going from the data entry to analysis just to give a few, few details. I hope you can all see the screen. Um, like this is the, we have different modules. One is service delivery. So this is for the, the end user when they're doing the data entry. Service delivery is any facilities which are providing services. And administrative unit is basically uh, province, district, and um, villages and all, and department on offices, which includes all the other places. And the, each and every type will have a different set of rules and things. All these things are organic again in DHRS. Okay, so um, quickly, I'll just show you. This is one health center where we have the basic information where it is located. And this health center is present in, this is in based from Lao. It's also present in Nechamas Gorotla. These are all three instances where they use. And the code are the same. This is the reporting hierarchy and location hierarchy. And sometimes we need to have both. This is also the same question which Nora asked me last time. Um, for example, central level of hospital, they will not report to your province. They will report directly to the national um, ministry of um, uh, hospital. But then, then like that's the reporting hierarchy. So sometimes we need to have both. And in this place app, you can also see what all the different catchment area of this particular villages is there. Access details, those are all different things what you have. Infrastructure, staffing details, service details, what kind of services they're providing, all these different things. And this key data, key data is something which we are not entering, but importing, pulling the data from other DHS students. For example, I just pulled the one thing which is called UPS assessment done by um, the um, external people and validate all the things which has a different kind of scoring system for whether you have infrastructure, facilities, human resource management, and plus some key data like last year, how many infection DA care happened and all these things. And these things are imported from different instances of DHRS to, to around here. And same thing with uh, the villages. I just want to quickly just show you um, one thing which is so this is the the village which present in different in Lao. There, each village has a different coding system, and then every year the coding system will change. Last year, the same village was called different things, different coding with the same name, but this year it will be changed. So we need to manage and maintain all those things because, like, we use this coding system to map to the different health facilities. And then like in, in Lao, they also did the, um, um, this assessment, like the health worker will go around to the, every village and say how many family members are there, how many families are there, what kind of health insurance they have, what, what is the primary source of water, uh, sanitation, and also ethnicity. So based on that one, they can try to calculate all the things. Again, this is imported from different DHS to instance to around here. Quickly, I'll go around to the, the analysis. The first thing what we tried to do was is to give an overview of what exists in DHRS2 with all these four different, you know, three different instances of DHRS2. Uh, let's see, yeah. So here, so first thing is just like how many, this is something for the, the, the manager. We just say 88% of your health center have all the equipment for essential health services. And only 80% of your health center has essential drug. And what is your hospital to population ratio, the health center and the doctor that you already have? And this is the ownership. 
which we already used to have every time in all the DHRs too, uh, whether it is owned by government, private, public, or PPM, and then the location, uh, urban, semi-urban, and all these things, and then how many health centers have ad adequate human resources. This we are pulling up from different area. And just a quickly, one quick thing is about, in Lao, they did this assessment for all the, the province um, from the, the World Bank and from the, the team. They, the province people will go around to the health center and do the assessment. In here, what I'm just like showing is how many health facility have adequate uh, equipment for essential health services, how many people don't have. And the gray one is the assessment has not been done. This is something in giving a full overview of what's happening. You can also filter, like for example, one of the best way of trying to deal with it, let's just say I'll take inpatient daycare, give me a list of all the facilities which has inpatient daycare more than let's like, say 200. Okay. And then like, I'll just say, okay, show me more than 200. Let me just like apply this. Out of uh, 2,500 um, uh, service delivery unit, uh, 248 have more than um, the um, 200 uh, inpatient daycare. Now, like what I will try to do is to include, give me a list of all the facilities where inpatient daycare is to more than 200. And then the, the nurses, are less than or equal to two because like we need to see like how what's the ratio like how many people have if you have more that's one thing but we are just like i understand less than two so these are all the health facilities we have less than two or two or less um, nurses and they have more workload and then you can also include uh, let me just quickly just show you one more thing when you filter, you get the list from here, and you can also see it in the map, what all the different places, how many, if you just see, these are all the areas where the inpatient daycare is not so much. And then like, you can just see around different places, see the hospitals or things around here, you can get to all the different details. Now other things which you can try to do, okay, this is fine, but let show me a list of all the, the places where the less uh, human resources less, but like I want 80% of essential um, service, let's say get done equal to you. So um, any facility which has adequate uh, equipment and drugs, but less nurse, and then they are for the um, inpatient daycare is 200. So if I just see the list, so now only 70. So that means if we can focus on this 70 facility and increase or have allocate the proper human resources, we can try to, to um, uh, get the good quality of the data. So one of the, the whole point of the organ profile is not only about managing, helping the DHS to core team, but also giving the access to the, to the admin level uh, people to just say where, which area they can try to do it. And then we can get the data from multiple DHS students and multiple uh, programs so that like we can try to do the analysis from here. So like if I just apply this, go to the map and just see these are all the areas are not good. So here this is the north and the south. So where you can try to just see all the different details. And when you come down, you can just see the all the access to the facilities and everything, whatever you have. Here so we also have um, what type of road they have, how much far from the, the district, uh, what kind of infrastructures they have, um, they, whether the internet is there, how many things are there, staffing details and all the different things, and what kind of services they provide. You can also filter by, just give me the list of all the best, uh, hospitals which are providing MCH only, so you can get the, all the filtering from them. That's basically, what I wanted to do present. Uh, yeah, so we, we have a very one box in our maturity profile left. I will, uh, so maybe I'll do that quickly, and yeah. I'm, I'm sure there are questions for you, John. Uh, so then we can take the rest of the time for the. 
I know that's uh, so I, just uh, very briefly on this sort of the. Uh, so the last thing is the, the infrastructure. And if we're thinking of the DHS2 infrastructure, it's sort of two things. One is the central, the server basically, which could be one or more, uh, one or more servers. The other is the infrastructure for the end users, which could be laptops, desktops, or it could be phones, tablets, depending a bit on the, the implementations and the, the purpose. Uh, I, I think, in general, what we recommend is to always sort of build on what is already there. That's sort of one one recommendation we have in general when when planning the implementation, um, and not sort of be too fixated on okay, it's a new implementation. We need to buy new devices for everyone. Maybe some of it is there. Maybe it can be sort of a hybrid where districts with computers use the, that facilities with computer use those so it's sort of thinking of how what is already in place can be uh, leveraged in the implementation uh, another key thing uh, in terms of the infrastructure is to actually plan for um, the maintenance that's something we see that is often forgotten we have a project we're going to buy 2000 devices but we have no budget to replace maybe you need to replace a third of them every year from the implementation. That's not part of the plan. Um, so, and servers needs to be paid every month, every year. Uh, if you have a physical server, that also, also needs to be replaced at some point. So thinking long-term and not just sort of, we're gonna roll out this in one year and then uh, that's as far as we think. Um, yeah, also the infrastructure, of course, it's sort of obvious, but uh, sometimes forgotten that as you're sort of extending the DHIS2 into new areas, maybe you're moving from aggregate to also introduce using tracker, that actually has implications for your infrastructure. So you might have a server that has been working well for five years for aggregate, but if you're then using the same server to roll out the tracker program, which has far more data for more users, that has implications also for your hosting. So you need to plan for that as well. Uh, Specifically, also in terms of the central infrastructure, the server, um, that is in practice not only about sort of your decision, do I want to use the cloud? Do I want to have it in country in a data center? It's also about what skills are needed and what are the costs of those. So it's sort of a complex um, uh, sort of a assessment that needs to be done with different um, uh implications so what is the cheapest is not necessarily feasible unless you have the people who can maintain sort of the cloud infrastructure for example so maybe you need to outsource more even if it's more costly if you don't have the right skills uh, in the ministry to maintain it in the core team yeah i think um no, no big surprises in terms of what we're seeing in countries here. There are, uh, of course, variations. Uh, one thing I would like to highlight in here is perhaps um, this idea of IT support. That's something that many countries, I think, have reported. So there might be devices, but there is no structure in place for actually helping the users out in the districts, in the facilities, if something happens to their device or their account. Um, so that may be one thing that standing out a bit from this assessment was sort of a lack of a proper structure for providing support on the infrastructure. Uh, in terms of the resources here, uh, quite a few relatively new academies presentations, sessions on this. Uh, this is linking to presentations, but we will also have recordings of the actual sessions on some of this. Uh, and then we have in the Android implementation guides, something around the Android specifically in terms of the what you need to consider and also uh, specifically on server hosting. Okay, then I think we have five minutes maximum for a couple of questions.
Um, so about the org unit profile app, uh, first of all, you had me at, I can manage multiple instances with one app. I am in love. That is brilliant. Um, but I'm really interested in how the data is stored because I can tell some of it's being pulled from data sets. Some of it uses org unit groups and some of it I'm guessing is custom attributes. And one of the issues with those things, or I, I'm guessing you probably come across this problem, so how you've addressed it, is then being able to track things over time. So if I've got my staff in my facility right now and I want to do some sort of analysis, can I also see what my facility staffing was two years ago and do a comparison? Yeah, so actually, like it's there, as you said, suggested, it's it's, it's exactly the same. Um, it it could happen. Um, it's thanks to like all the DHS to platform team, they made it into forty so that like you can link multiple DHS to instance or just you can pull. So one of your DHS to instance should be two forty. Rest on other things. If it is above thirty six, is more than fine. Um, so what we tried to did was is for the the key main things when we create an organic profile. These are mandatory field. Like for example. Um, the the groups like the location, the, those things at least has to be see there. It's an um, it's will fields will be there, but it's optional for you to select whether it is urban, rural, or things that you can try to to deal with it. And some attributes, um, what we are trying to store, we are not storing as a data element attribute, but we are storing it in the um, in the data store itself of the app. So to try to to use the uh, the things because if you create because this is an app which will be which can be installed in any DHS to at the later on. We want to make it as generic as possible so that like people can install this app and then they can point to different DHS to instance where they are using it and then they can synchronize the data. So it can you can use it as a organic synchronization, not only that one, but also organic group and group set. About pulling the data, you can, what we've been thinking is to, you can specify the data for like, okay, give me only last year data. Or last six months data because we don't want to we want to encourage people to use the dhs to analytical tool but this is just to for your comparison to try to, to get the data in and when you specify those data whether it is from this in this instance you take program indicator in this instance you take aggregate data value and then we we pull it and store it in as a tracker so the behind the argument uh, profile app is a tracker data model and that's how we can try to, to manage and then we can also analyze the data by two different hierarchy, one based on the reporting hierarchy, one based on the location hierarchy. Okay, just a quick follow-up. Yeah. So, so that means because it's tracker data, yeah. it's not just available through your own analytics, it will yes. be available through any- Any, uh, any place. Okay. Yeah. And so then right. you can like any kind of changes, you can also monitor over time and also audit. Yeah, there's one there, one there. Just a quick question, and it's uh, applicable to your app, um, fantastic app, by the way, but just in general, the apps in the App Store, um, it does DHIS or does um, UIO um, do an assessment of the long-term sustainability of these apps? So let's say you yeah. adopt one of these apps, and um, but they're being managed by, you know, other organizations. Yeah. How will, you know, countries know or be able to trust that this would persist over the long term, yeah. over the long term? Yeah, actually, this is the, the the app, which is a collaborative effort by Hispatia Hub. That includes Hisp India, Hisp uh, Indonesia, uh, Bangladesh, Pakistan as, the, as a whole. And one of the, um, this was from the, um, the Global Fund and the Gavi things. We have created this um, Hispatia Hub. And this will be the one of the product which will be going to manage and maintain for all the different re releases. So that's the one of the ownership which we um, will take. That's that's in already in the in the plan. Yes. Just, but I think you also said sort of in general, and I think that's a good question that we are discussing how sort of how to improve the maintenance, uh, sort of transparency into the apps and what is the plans, what is the roadmap, etc. Because uh, it is a good question, and there are some apps there that has been maintained for many years. There are some that have sort of been released and then not really without having a clear roadmap. Yeah. So it's something we're discussing how to make more transparent. Yeah. Another yeah. question here. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Um, this question relates to the org unit profile, or two questions. Yeah. One is how would this relate to a country's master facility registry? Because it does look like a master facility yeah. registry, the first question. The second question is, we know that um, 
for planning, various population data is used. So there might be for reporting, it might be the statistical data from the statistics office, but for campaign planning, it might be different population data that's used again for ordering drugs. It's again, different data that's used. So how would that be accounted for in the uh, profile? Thank you. Now, the, for your first question, like it's about, it is uh, master facilities, but the problem is in DHIS to what we call as an organet, which also includes province district, which are not part of Ministry of Health. So what we have done is to write down um, a bit of manual, just saying what all different uh, classification, what do you think? And if there is already a master facility list, it's perfectly fine for, for many countries where you don't really have master facility list and all things, and you're trying to maintain that when a different instance and merging together. So that's when like we just um, just say this can be a helpful tool to, to manage uh, all the other things uh, fr uh, from your side. And most of the time, especially they talk about um, uh, the linkages. So in the master facility list, usually they talk about location-based uh, reporting, but not the, the how you are reporting, how the people are reporting to the hierarchy. And that's also very, very different. Most of the places we haven't seen that. And in DHIS too, it is reporting-based hierarchy, not only location-based hierarchy. Uh, about the second point about the population, um, you still use the your normal DHIS too for doing all the analysis and all. What this app is this in terms of your organ profile, what data is key to include it? So it's this other way around of thinking. If the, the campaign managers want to try to assess the data, so they have their own DHIS and own way of trying to deal with it, that's fine. But like what data from there is more relevant for the organic management. So that's when like you try to come around here. And then what you want to try to quickly show, okay, in my facility, 80% of the people have been immunized. That can be pulled directly from the statistics. So here, that's why like we want to just say, these data is pulled from your routine health information system. It cannot be modified in the organic app. Just a reminder that there will be lots of noise in a few seconds, I guess. It's it's yep. Perfect. <laughs> Including the phone. So that was the lunch uh, signal, I guess. Yeah. Thanks. Lunch for a whole Norway. <laughs>